welcome back. So let's get started with Emerald Ashmore University. This is our, um, our third session today. And the way this works is I'll be giving the presentation. This is Jody Ellis. <laughs> I'll be giving this presentation and on on board with us uh, for the chat room we have Amy Stone my partners Amy Stone and Robin Usborne and uh, also we have a couple of guests which I'll tell you about in a minute as you know Emerald Ashbor University is something that Ohio State and Michigan State and Purdue University started in cooperation with the US Forest Service to help deliver information about Emerald Ashbor in a costly way this session that we're doing today as all the previous sessions will be available on emeraldashboard.info and also you can contact any of the three of us if you have any questions you'd like us to ask thanks to all of you who filled out the pretest I've gotten quite a few responses from that so I really appreciate it okay this is me again um, it's always nice to see who you're talking to now one thing I did want to bring up before we got going too far I've had a few requests for people who want to get uh, uh, CCU credits for this and that's great we are unable to um, arrange that for you however if you want to arrange those credits for yourself what we can provide for you is the uh, verif verification of attendance if you're on and we can provide an agenda that you can take to whatever organization uh, you want your credits from and we'll be happy to do that all you need to do is email one of us and in this case you should probably email me okay whoops there we go I'm gonna start by saying something that I firmly believe which is change is inevitable except from a vending machine and uh, what I mean by that is as research on insecticides progresses the costs and methods of treating trees will will continue to change as more things are found out and so it's very important to stay up to date on treatment options and that's one thing that we're going to be providing you from Emerald Ash Borer uh, University okay all right I'm going to also tell you that that this presentation is based on a bulletin that came out this summer called insecticide options for protecting ash trees from emerald ash borer and you can see the authors there on the side um, very distinguished researchers who have worked and done several studies on uh, the the pesticides that we're going to talk about and this is based upon scientific information and studies that they've conducted yeah and uh, of course here is a more detailed list whoops hang on just a second what's going on it's not progressing. oh okay is uh is it, are people having trouble with this progressing we got it now. oh okay never mind i'm sorry this this is a list of the authors of that bulletin so they're all you can always contact them as well Today's guests that we have sitting in on for us are Deb McCullough at Michigan State University. And Deb is probably the foremost researcher on pesticides for emerald ash borer at, the to at this time. And I also have my boss, Cliff Sadoff, from Purdue University. And they will be answering questions in the chat room. If you have a question, please feel free to go ahead and enter it in the chat room. And I'll remind you, if you have trouble keeping up with the presentation and the chat simultaneously, you can always go back at this at the recording at emerald info to review it again all right let's start in the logical place let's talk just a little bit about emerald ash borer itself and ash trees if we understand those two things then we're going to be able to uh, realize how we should treat with pesticides now I'm not going to dwell on emerald ash borer because the last two sessions I think explained that pretty successfully it's a bupressed wood boring insect and and what happens with emerald ash borer that is of interest to us today is that the EAB larvae feed in the cambium 
layer of the tree tissue that's located between the bark and the wood and they produce galleries that eventually girdle and uh, kill the entire tree and in that illustration down there of the larva moving through you can see just how deep it goes into the tree not terribly deep but one thing about ash trees that you have to understand is they belong to a classification called ring porous and what that means is that their vascular vessels are relatively large and they're concentrated right under that bark where that larva is feeding. Unfortunately, this makes ash trees especially vulnerable to insects like a EAB who feed in that layer. So that's why there that's explains why EAB is so devastating to um, ash trees and it also explains what we need to do to handle EAB in an ash tree. The research has indicated that by far the way to go with treating uh, ash trees for emerald ash borer is with systemic insecticides. And I'll explain that in just a little bit. Systemic insecticides are not sprays. You don't, well, I mean, you don't spray the leaves and walk away and hope that's going to work. Um, but systemic insecticides are actually applied into the tree's tissue itself. And you can see that... Um, well, this is uh, this is kind of a, a reminder if you if you uh, are a little loose on your tree anatomy, which I am. But what we're trying to do is target this tissue, the the cambium, and out on the outside edge of the cambium uh, is the. Um, whoop, wait a minute, got to figure this out because I always get confused. On the outside edge edge of it is the phloem, and then on the inside edge of this cambial layer is the xylem. The phloem consists of those cells that conduct food from the leaves to the rest of the plant and the xylem is the one that conducts water and minerals so these are these this cambial layer is the living tissue and that's our target we want to get it in the pesticide in that area so the tree itself can take up the pesticide spread it throughout the tissues where that larva is feeding and even spread it all the way up into the leaves where the adults feed to take them out too now, um, there are several ways to apply systemic pesticides, and we're going to talk about four of them. Those are soil drenches, soil injections, trunk injections, and then the basal trunk sprays. Uh, those are the ones that are the best, we think. Let's see here. Whoops. There we go. Once again, systemic insecticides must enter the tree's vascular system in order for it to be spread and to kill EAB. Systemic insecticides have been used many, many times to kill phloem feeding larvae and leaf feeding adults. So there's a lot of a good history with that type of system. Now, a lot of folks ask about cover sprays because let's face it, cover sprays are a lot easier to use when you spray the outside of the tree, the foliage and all. Unfortunately, cover sprays don't have a lot of effect on those larvae feeding beneath the bark. In fact, they have no effect on the larvae feeding beneath the bark, so you do need to use the systemic insecticides. Now, the other thing I'd like to, to say before we really get started on this, the insecticides themselves is that in the case of EAB, these products are by far best used as preventative treatments. They can be used as rescue treatments to a point but use as a preventative treatment is the ideal situation for use of systemics. I, um, whoop, I keep pushing the wrong button. I apologize. One of the biggest issues about pesticides for emerald ash borer is deciding when to treat or not to treat. And that is indeed the question. And I, I'm going to say that figuring uh, out if it makes sense to treat your ash trees with insecticides for EAB is, is, can be a little complicated. And you have many factors to consider when you're deciding whether to treat or not. And that includes your budget, obviously, the cost of the insecticide, um, the expense of application, the size of the trees, and the likelihood of success, as well as potential costs of removing and replacing the trees. All these things have to, to be considered on an individual basis. The other thing I'll say before we get really started is some insecticides may not be labeled for use in all states. So if you have a question about some of the things we're discussing today, you want to check with your state chemist for information uh, on whether or not that is labeled yet for your state. So those things are out of the way. Off we go. 
Okay, I will also tell you that it is difficult to treat multiple ash trees such as those in the, the uh, rural forests and woodlots and the reason for that is pretty simple. Uh, it's just very hard to apply systemic pesticides on a large scale. Very time consuming and at the, this time you have to do it every year or two or three years so it's, it's quite an effort to do it on a large scale and it gets to be quite costly to do that. So when you're thinking about treating ash trees, you want to focus your treatment efforts on healthy trees that are most important to your particular landscape. I don't know what that thing's doing now. There we go. Yeah, not every ash tree in home or urban settings can or should be protected. What you're going to look for for a candidate for treatment are healthy, full leaf trees that are doing well. As you can see in this picture on the left under healthy, those are the ones you want to protect. If you look at the pictures on the right, uh, one of those trees, the one that's on the left of that little block, is actually um, a victim of emerald ash borer and it is way too late to rescue that tree, unfortunately. The other one has other issues, side issues, possibly a disease issue. Those are not good candidates. Well, we know why they're not good candidates, right? because they are because their um, tissues their vascular tissues are impeded by disease or by emerald ash borer they're not going to be able to circulate systemic insecticides very well so concentrate on the healthy ones here's just a little thing that that uh, we came up with to help you make decisions about treating uh, when you go out and you're inventorying your ash trees take a look at them and put them into one of these three categories and that's low value ash trees those little scrubby ones that that maybe are way in the back lots that don't really mean a lot to you, you consider low value. Moderate value ones are uh, trees that you can afford to lose, but you may want to put some other trees in there and let them grow and, until you take that tree down. And then the high value ash trees are the ones that are the, the show pieces of your yard or, or something that's very important to you. Those are the ones that we're going to put into the um, high value category. And once again, I'm going to keep emphasizing this. The trees have to be in good condition initially or your chances of, of keeping emerald ash borer away from them where you have uh, emerald ash borer infestations is, is not so good. Okay, an unhealthy, what do we mean by healthy tree? What you want to look at is the ash tree, an ash tree that's missing 50% of its canopy, uh, the leaves, um, well, the leaf cover is not going to do well with treatment. Some studies suggest that, that at 25% it may not do well for treatment, but 50% is, is at currently the rule. And once again, all of this changes as we find out more and more about these uh, situations. I'm going to say it again because this is very important if you're considering treatment. It should be started before emerald ash borer attacks. Well, how do you know when to start a treatment on a healthy ash tree? The rule of thumb is if emerald ash borer appears and is found in your county, don't wait. That's, that's, your, that's when you should go. And you can, of course, treat them at any time, but that is the ultimate uh, criteria. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're going to get into the actual insecticides that are used for control of EAB. One thing I found interesting on your pretests was that um, uh, there was a lot of confusion about whether or not um, there was any type of pesticides that were appropriate and effective for use by homeowners. And a lot of people thought there wasn't. Well, I have good news for you. Uh, there actually are some insecticides that homeowners can use quite well. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But I want to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about. As I told you, we're going to concentrate on the systemic insecticides and the four ways that we get them into that tree tissue. And the first one, the, uh, the first category is soil injections and soil drenches. And the second category, trunk injections, basal trunk sprays, and then I've included protective cover sprays because some people like to use that as a supplemental treatment. But remember that by itself doesn't really, what doesn't really do a lot. So let's talk about insecticides that homeowners can use. And I've made this little chart. I'll be showing you this as we go through. 
for homeowners, products containing 1.4% seven percent imidacloprid is what we're looking for and they are always going to be applied as a soil drench if you're a homeowner there really isn't much um, else available to you as a homeowner but it's really not a bad thing because these can be very very effective products you can see that their uh, bare advanced garden tree and shrub insect control is the one that's most commonly used but there are several others that are up and coming fertilome uh, is one that's coming up and there are other products that you can look for just make sure that it contains 1.47 percent imidacloprid and it's labeled as a drench for emerald ash borer. Uh, you use them one time a year, preferably in the spring. Uh, sometimes the manufacturer says that you can use them in the fall, but research indicates that the best time to use these soil drenches is in the spring and pretty early, mid-April to mid-May, depending on your location, and I'll show you a map of that in just a minute. We expect in 2010 to add to this arsenal with uh, uh, I'll always say this wrong. <laughs> uh, di Dinotefuran. I'm so sorry. I always think this was something to do with dinosaurs. That's how, but it doesn't. But Dinotefuran is available right now in a formulation that's combined with a fertilizer that's used to treat rose pests of roses. Uh, that's not appropriate for what we're trying to do. But in 2010, they should be releasing a soil drench product for homeowners under the name Spectricide. So keep your eyes open for that one. And this is a, a this also is what we're going to look at for professionals there's s several more uh, possibilities for professional use and you can see that they are in the soil injection or drench category trunk injection category and then we have uh, systemic bark spray and I've also once again added the preventative bark and foliage cover sprays although by once again by themselves they're not so good now, one thing that, that, we're, that, like I told you, we're going to go by the findings of our researchers that published our bulletin. So I'm going to kind of gray out some of these products as ones that did not perform really well in the trials that these researchers have done. These products are certainly available, and you can certainly use them if you wish to, but they don't seem to perform as well as the ones that, that um, are not grayed out. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. That's kind of an overview of what we're looking at. Okay, you noticed back on the other slide that imidacloprid is certainly something that's used uh, very much, and it is a, a widely tested soil applied systemic, and it's used for many purposes, but it certainly is good at controlling emerald ash borer. It's a neonicotinoid, uh, which is a neurotoxin modeled after nicotine, so think about that when you're lighting up your cigarettes. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is when applied. Uh, I'm sorry, when applied as a soil drench or through the trunk or soil or trunk injection, imidacloprid is taken up by the plant roots and then m is moved by the tree itself throughout the, the uh, its tissues and becomes poisonous to those larvae that are feeding on that tree tissue and also can kill off some of the adults when it gets up to the leaf tissue. Now let's. Uh, we're going to first. Our first category is the soil applied systemic insecticides, and we're going to talk about soil drenches and also high pressure soil injections. The soil drenches can be used by both professionals and homeowners. The high pressure soil injections are for use by professionals only. I guess we'll start with our homeowner situation, and once again, we talked a little bit about some of these products that are out there and once again please read your labels and um, these are the things that you can find most commonly and they're good products and they they can be used very successfully in the right circumstances soil drenches uh, at this time until we get the um, the new one in 2010 right now are all 1.47 percent imidacloprid and they're very simple to use that's the great thing about them if you've made a good decision on which tree as a homeowner to protect you remember you want a nice tree with a good canopy you should have very good success it's very simple you mix the product in a bucket uh, according to packet 
directions, no special equipment required, and you do want to pour this around the base of the tree. Notice in this illustration, he's not way out there by where his feet are. He's right around the base of the tree. Okay. An important note about tree size. Homeowners can expect to use these imidacloprid drenches with very good results on trees that are up to 45 inches in circumference. And um, if you need a reminder on what circumference is, that's like measuring yourself for a pair of pants right around the waist, as opposed to diameter, which is the length straight through. So uh, just keep that in mind because we'll talk about other things. But that's what we're going to do. Uh, up to 45 inches in circumference, your tree can be treated very nicely with these soil drenches. After that, though, they're going to need a little extra help, and you will probably need to call in a professional applicator to use a, uh, even the same insecticides, but in a different delivery syst system. Oh, there's that again. Okay. Imidacloprid binds to mulch and leaf litter. So when you're, when you're a homeowner and you're going to apply your soil drench, you need to take a rake and pull that leaf litter um, and mulch away from the base of the tree. That's very, very important because otherwise the tree's not going to get the imidacloprid. Okay, so um, yeah, you want to pull or Oh boy, you want to pour the insecticide directly on the soil, not through layers of stuff that accumulates. Another important thing, this is also true of soil injections too, and uh, also uh, trunk injections too. You want to do these things when the soil is moist, but not saturated. If you have a tree that's already waterlogged, uh, you're not going to get very good uptake of the insecticide. So that's something to continue, or <laughs> that's something to consider is what I'm trying to say. Also, the opposite is true when the soil is extremely dry, you're also not going to get good uptake of that insecticide. So you want to find a, a situation where the tree, the soil around the tree is moist but not saturated in either case. Here's an important note about soil drenches. If you're treating more than one tree, if you're treating multiple trees in your area, remember that there is a, a legal limit on how much imidacloprid you can apply to soil. And it works out to... Okay, I don't know why. Robin? Uh, am I still gone? I'm okay? Okay, sorry about that, folks. That's kind of hard because I can't hear any feedback on this. Okay, uh, this works out. Well, I'll just repeat where I was. You have a, an upper limit on how much imidacloprid you can apply to it, an acre area per year. And that works out to about 12 trees with circumferences of 30 inches, the, a pr enough product to treat those. After that is in violation of the label, and you may actually be contaminating nearby groundwater. To avoid this problem, most people are not going to be treating that many trees, uh, but if, in, in case you are, to avoid this problem, keep a running total of the tree's diameters and make sure that that total does not exceed 120 inches. Or if you're working with the tree circumferences, uh, make sure that does not exceed 377 inches. Once again, there's that reminder of circumference and diameter. So there you go. Hopefully that'll help. Okay. The timing of soil drenches in the northern parts of the EAB range, as depicted by the big red N, this is kind of an uh, estimate of, of where we're going to make this dividing line. You should apply the uh, drenches by mid-May, that's the northern part, but in places south of this line, you should probably apply these soil drenches by mid-April. It takes about four to six weeks for the pesticide to, to be uptaken and moved through the tree. So you want to give it plenty of time before uh, a good warm spring weather really hits in. Now, I, I'm not going to do this for us today, but if you want to go back uh, and 
lift this address off the recording after we're done here. This is a great uh, video demonstration of a soil drench done by Ohio State. So if you are curious as to how that works, that's a good place to go. All right. Now we're going to move on to soil injected systemic insecticides. This is for professionals only and this is done when your tree exceeds that 45 inch circumference rate. This gives the tree a real boost in getting that uh, insecticide into the tissue that you want as opposed to a drench and is a, um, a fairly safe way to do this. You, it does require specialized equipment and specialized formula. Uh, formulations of the pesticide, although imidacloprid is used for this as well, it's applied directly into the tree's root zone around the base of the tree. Now these injections push that insecticide just below the soil surface about uh, two to four inches down uh, and these are made within about 18 inches of the trunk and that's because that's where the density of those fine roots of the tree is the highest and that's where we want to go with this insecticide. Nice thing about the soil injections too if you're near uh, a, a water system or something the soil injections can help prevent runoff on slope surfaces into streams or ponds or whatever is nearby. Okay, and there's kind of a quick review of some of the products that are available for professionals to be used for soil injection. Okay, let's go on to the, the next topic, which is the trunk injected systemic insecticides. Once again, imidacloprid is often used for these trunk injections, and so is a, a new, newer product called emamectin benzoate, or triage. That's something that just came out within the last year or so, um, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Okay, what is a trunk injection? Once again, I'll remind you that's for professionals only. Uh, that is the direct injection into the tree's trunk, and it uses a very a closed system, which turns out to be safer for the applicator, the soil, or the air, because nothing's flying around. It's getting injected into that tree. The optimal timing of trunk injections occurs after the trees have leafed out, so a little bit later than the soil drenches but you want to catch it before the EAB eggs have hatched. So you're looking at, at uh, doing these trunk injections between mid-May and mid-June. Earlier in the south, later in the north. So you can use that map that we showed you late, or earlier too. Now one possible drawback to the trunk injections is by the act of injecting you are creating a wound in the tree and or maybe possibly several wounds because usually there's more than one injection site and that can in itself attract um, pests of ash trees and can distress the tree. However, in most cases the benefit of doing it outweighs the risks of doing that. There's a couple of the delivery systems that are used. Arborjet um, is used quite frequently. Moget and Wedgel, the results for those haven't been as promising as the Arborjet, but they still are available and out there. Once again, here's kind of a review of those products. Um, triage is a new one. I'm going to uh, talk about that just a little bit. Triage is something that just came on the scene. It's an emamectin benzoate, and it has been it has performed extremely well in the tests that have been conducted on it. The really good news about triage is that it has a very high kill rate and that kill rate actually is sustained for more than one year. Looks like um, two years you don't have to treat except every two years and possibly three. It looks like we may be able to go three instead of yearly as with the other products which is a tremendous advantage for many reasons including financial reasons. So triage is probably the in, um, at the moment, triage is probably in the lead as far as being effective, but once again, things change, so keep that in mind. Now, the systemic bark sprays are a different delivery system for systemic insecticides. A lot of people like these because you don't really need uh, specialized equipment. Uh, this is still done by professionals only, but, but um, the, the insecticide that's used most often is a di <laughs> I want to do it again. 
dinotid tefiron, and it is labeled for an application. It's kind of cool because what, what they do is they spray this a formulation of this on the lower five to six feet of the trunk, and they actually spray it right onto the bark, and this pesticide will actually go through the bark and into that tissue with uh, little to do. It's pretty effective stuff. Sometimes they, um, the tree will then take the, when it gets to the tissue level, it'll take up the pesticide and spread it, just as if you've injected it or, or applied it as a soil drench or injection. So it's uh, kind of promising. Now there is one possible drawback. If you use a surfactant, often surfactants are used to help facilitate that movement of the pesticide through that bark. It's added into the pesticide and it helps. Um, there is a temporary side effect to doing to using the surfactant, which uh, is called pentrobark, and that is it kind of bleaches out the lichens and the algae that are normally present on an ash tree. So you get this um, kind of two-toned looking tree. I don't know, maybe there's some landscape people out there who like that look, but um, anyway, it, if you're considering aesthetics of this, it could be a problem for you, although it is temporary, but I don't know how long it takes for the uh, algae and lichens to re get their color back, so I'm not sure about that. Once again, the name of the product that is used for systemic bark sprays is, now, is Safari, and it's a Dinotepharon, and it's a systemic bark spray. Application is early May to mid-June. Okay, this is the, the, I'm going to include protective cover sprays briefly um, because sometimes they are used as a supplement, but as you understand now, they do not affect the feeding larva, which is what really damages the trees. The timing has to be absolutely perfect on applying protective cover sprays. The application itself has to be perfect, which means all of the, of the, um, the foliage and sometimes the bark and all have to be covered with this stuff. Um, it's there's a lot of drift even on the best days you're going to have a lot of pesticide drift with this application method and it's really the least effective in reducing the emerald ash borer population as well um, so I mean they're there there you certainly can uh, professionals and homeowners can use some of these but we question whether or not it's really worth it if you're using the systemics you're probably going to get better control without adding this stuff in too but just as a review, there are some of the products that are out there as a protective, or protective cover spray. Astro, Permethrin, Onyx, Bifenthrin, Tempo, which is Cyfluthrin, and then of course Seven, which is Carbaryl, which we're all pretty well um, familiar with. There, you were going to do two applications at one week intervals on this. The first spray should occur when black locust trees are blooming in early spring. This has absolutely nothing to do with black locust trees, but that's a good indicator as far as time goes as to when this stuff should be applied. So you're not you're going to have to learn what an ash tree is and what a black locust tree is as well. So. Have fun with that. I'm going to kind of wrap up the insecticide section of this with just a few comments uh, that some of the points I really want you to take home. Uh, begin to treat your trees when EAB is first reported in your county is very, very important. I guess if you took a step back from that, you'd say, go out now. If you, if you don't have emerald ash borer around, go out now and look at your ash trees. Make your decisions about which ones you're going to treat and then when you hear that emerald ash borer is in your county that's when you want to implement those decisions and start your treatment or or whatever you decide to do i'm going to remind you again too that trees with more than 50 percent dieback for any reason doesn't matter if it's emerald ash borer or not but if you have a tree that's struggling along and has 50 percent dieback um, it, it cannot be saved we can pretty well guarantee you that and some studies suggest that you're going to see some reduced effectiveness with these pesticides at 25 percent dieback so keep that in mind emmectin benzoate or once again it's called triage appears to work for two to three years on trees up to 25 inches dbh or 78 inches in circumference so uh, that's our 
probably our leading product at the moment, although like I said, things do change. Soil injections, um, which are about two to four inches deep, and soil drenches are most effective if they're applied properly under the proper conditions at the base of the trunk. If you're going to go that route, pay attention to the soil moisture level before you, uh, before you apply this to help the tree work with the uptake. Soil applications, including the injections and the drenches, seem to be more effective in spring than fall. So if you're budgeting for one treatment a year, go with the spring treatment rather than the fall one. Now trees with uh, DBH, that's diameters, diameters at breast height, about four or feet off the ground, greater than 15 inches require, and that's about 45 inches circumference, require doses or products that can only be applied by professionals. So if you have a tree that's very, very big and you are convinced that you're going to go out and use soil drenches on it, you may not get the result that you want. You may have to call in a professional to help that tree right away. Now be aware of the label restrictions. Read your labels whenever you apply any kind of pesticide. The professionals out there know that well. But read your labels and uh, be aware of the label restrictions that limit the amount of the product that can be used per acre. You certainly don't want to violate that. For more detailed information on, on insecticides for EAB, and this is also a good place to uh, grab a copy of that bulletin that this presentation is based on, visit emeraldashboard.info. That's, of course, the, the site that's uh, um, the most um, important one that we have because it tells you it has so much information there. And Robin happens to run it, which is a good thing. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit too about biological control of emerald ash borer just to give you an idea of what's going on, um, what's going on and what's out there. If you don't remember or you don't know, biological control is the practice of importing and releasing host-specific natural enemies from a pest native range to control populations in the area of introduction of these invasive species. So it's pretty simple and you're probably aware of that. The good news is that researchers uh, believe now that emerald ash borer populations could eventually be uh, lowered or managed by natural enemies. And uh, we know this is possible because the numbers of EAB in Asia, where emerald ash borer is native to, are always pretty low, and that's because of they, that they have resistant host plants, resistant ash trees, in other words, the clima climatic conditions, which are similar to those here, and the presence of natural enemies. So it's controlled over there, and our goal is to get it controlled over here by biological control. One of the um, most important type of natural enemies that are used in biological control are called parasitoids. And parasitoids are, uh, refers to insects that feed on or in a single host insect and, and kills it. So we'll talk about parasitoids. Typically, at least in the case of emerald ash borer, these are the larvae of these very, very small, even sometimes smaller than gnats, uh, tiny little wasp species. And we know that when emerald ash borer was first found in Michigan, uh, first recognized in Michigan anyway, uh, during 2003 and 2004, they did surveys and they found out that less than 1% of these EAB larvae were parasitized and that EAB eggs that they were finding at that period contained no parasitoids. So we know that we were starting basically with a clean slate on getting these parasitoids to act. Okay. Researchers with the USDA Forest Service and Michigan State University, soon after they, they made that um, uh, analysis, they went to China and over several, great effort and over si several years, brought back three new species of wasps that parasitize and kill emerald ash borer. And um, once they got these back, these things were held in quarantine situations and tested and tested and tested to make sure that they were not going to move off into other species. Um, once that was learned, laboratory methods for rearing these, um, these species were developed. And that, believe me, is no small feat. It's very hard to raise these very tiny, tiny little specimens. But some of the Forest Service labs, and particularly at MSU, have developed those methods. And in 2007, after a lot of testing, these parasitoids were released 
into selected Michigan field sites and um, they were let go and then uh, later on their um, there were studies to evaluate establishment, monitor spread rates, and determine effects on EB, EAB population dynamics and ash survival. These, the rearing releases and evaluations continue on to this day, and the range of that has expanded. There's several states involved now with these releases, and as our, um, our rearing gets better, the rearing of these things gets better, more and more of these are released. So it is promising. It's not going to be a quick fix for anything. It's going to take years and years and years for these to be established and actually have an effect on emerald ash borer, but it is certainly a step in the right direction to do that. Here's an introduction to those Chinese parasitoids that they, that they brought back. I don't know. This is um, up in the top picture. You can see an actual emerald ash borer egg, which I assure you is very difficult to see with your naked eye. So this will give you an idea of just how small this little critter is. The other ones are slightly bigger, but not much bigger. and. Um, those are the ones that are in play right now that have been imported from China. We did have kind of a nice surprise, too, in that a parasitoid that um, lives in Michigan spontaneously started attacking emerald ash borer larva, too. We're not sure that this one is a native. It's possible it came over with, with um, this species or another species, but at the moment, it's possible that it is a native, and if that's true, it's very encouraging because in one site, parasitism by this wasp um, was at 20%, which is a very nice deterrent for emerald ash borer larvae. So um, keeping our fingers crossed on that one and the other three as well. Now, we do have one natural enemy uh, already in place and already doing a great job, and those are woodpeckers. And uh, the, the wonderful thing that they do is that they're very, very good at helping us detect emerald ash borer. You can see in the picture on the right, uh, you can't really ignore that tree because all the, where it's bare is where emerald ash borer has, or I'm sorry, where the woodpecker has flecked off pieces of the bark to get to the emerald ash borer larva. So when detectors are out and they see that tree, uh, tree that looks like that, they know something bad is going on. So it's, uh, woodpeckers have been a wonderful detection tool for us. Now, unfortunately, their effects on uh, controlling e EAB populations, although there are effects from them doing it, those effects are very small. So um, we just, we're glad to have the woodpeckers aboard, but, but we can't leave it at just that. So by the way, if you see emerald, uh, woodpeckers attacking your trees, especially the downy or the hairy woodpeckers, you want to go out there and take a closer look. Something's going on. Okay, uh, that's the end of my presentation, and I did want to leave some time for questions because I know that was a lot of material thrown at you. If you have specific questions about pesticides, I'm probably going to defer to Dr. Sadoff or Dr. McCullough, um, who is, uh, oh, Deb is now telling me that the last parasitoid is definitely a native species, so there's good news for us. So that's great. Okay. Um, Anyway, we're going to go with questions, and you can type in your question, and if it's something that I'm not qualified to answer, I'll refer it to them. I hope you've enjoyed this. This will be posted uh, very quickly, probably by the end of the day. Uh, so if you want to review it for anything, it's there. So, thank you. And I'm watching the screen now for any kind of questions. Has triage been approved for use in Wisconsin? Yes. Yes. Could bringing, uh, Carolyn Hathaway, could bringing parasitoids from Asia be un an unsafe thing to do? It's always, um, it's always something you want to do very carefully to introduce parasitoids from another country into uh, where you are. And that is because, of course, as we've learned in the past, sometimes they can get out of control and attack other species, other native species. And however, in this case, the research has been very, very positive uh, that they do only attack emerald ash borer. They're very specialized on emerald ash borer. So in this case, I think we're, we're doing pretty well with that. Okay. And uh, Catherine Duncan, what was the name of the native wasp species, Anacolis? Okay, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to back up and show you again. 
And there it is. That's the native species that we were looking at. Okay. And uh, Mike Davis, is there any guess as to when biological controls may mean that insecticides are no longer necessary? I can tell you that uh, although that sounds wonderful, it's, that would be a long, long, long time off just because it takes a long time for everything to get established. But um, it is certainly a sign of hope. Okay, here's a question from Kathy Dutton Hefner. <laughs> Sorry if I mispronounced that. To treat or not to treat, what distance in miles would you use? I'm going to let Cliff answer that. Cliff, if you want to come over and talk about that, that'd be great. Within 10 miles. Within 10 miles, he's telling me. In yeah. Indiana. In, in Indiana, our counties are about uh, 10, 10 to 15 miles uh, across, so that's what we're using. So we're saying within, within about 10 miles. But the problem with that is we really don't know exactly um, where it is because you know the entire area hasn't been completely scanned. So that's why uh, we we're using the county. Okay, thank you, Cliff. Thank you very much. And I'm back. And let's see, we have a question. Well, yeah, I'm. T uh, someone mentioned they were glad to see Dave Capyard get uh, get his due, and I'm glad to see that too. Okay, what do the eggs and entrance holes look like? The eggs are extremely small. They're kind of yellow. They would be on the surface of the bark. And the, the entrance holes are so small, you will not even see them. So don't, don't worry too much about them. What we really look for are the exit holes as an indication of where that is. Okay, I'm backing up here. Let's see. And here's a question too. Is the imidacloprid system systemic application at enough concentration to hurt fruit foliage feeding creatures such as birds and other bugs? And as I that's once again a pesticide question. Cliff, maybe you want to take that one. The answer is no, but I I will uh, I'll let them answer that because I'm not a. Um, Boy, we're getting so many questions. Is the imidacloprid systemic application at enough concentration to hurt fruit foliage feeding creatures such as birds and other bugs? Okay, Deb, would you mind commenting on that because you have information on residues that uh, Cliff thinks would be valuable. If you don't mind typing up that answer, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Let's see, are the biological control agents available for use in other states yet? And that the answer to that is that I believe that program is controlled by the Forest Service and uh, because of it, the, um, the rearing is the part that's holding us up, but they are releasing those to other states as those things are available. So the answer is possibly. <laughs> what is the impact of imidacloprid on pollen gathering bees? Well, once again, because imidacloprid is applied as a systemic pesticide, you, you really reduce the amount of, of impact on bees. Of course, imidacloprid is not something that you want to um, have bees contact because it does kill them. But because these are systemic applications, it is drastically reduced. And also remember that, that you're, do, you're only treating very specific ash trees. This is not broadcast wildly all over the place. So I think the, um, the answer about the bees is that it is very minimized, but it is acknowledged that they can hurt fleas, or fleas, bees. <laughs> Probably fleas too. Okay, wait a minute. I'm backing up because we're getting so many questions. Hang on a second. Is there anything a homeowner can or should do in the winter to protect their ash trees? Um, <clears throat> you want to always maintain good stewardship of your ash trees, but the thing about winter is that there is a it's a wonderful time to check for woodpecker damage, and you can also see the holes better as well. So as, uh, just keep your trees in good health, and that's just routine watering, pruning. Um, I don't know how much of that is done in the winter, but but do keep an eye on the general health of your trees and do that all year round, not just winter, of course. Okay, let's see here. Do the insecticides have any effect on the biological controls one might implement? Cliff, did you want to answer that one? 
Okay, hang on a second. I'm going to have Cliff comment on that one. Are you going to type that, Cliff? Okay, he's going to type an answer for that, Gene. Okay, and Craig, the insecticide paper stated that drenches and soil injections should be near the trunk where high concentrations of fine roots exist. This appears counterintuitive to what we have heard about location of tree roots uh, at or around the drip line to one to two times uh, height out from the trunk. Please comment on how that small amount of root area picks up enough products to be effective. I think that might be one for Dr. McCullough as well. So, and uh, like I said, I'm only seeing these as they come in, so she may have already answered that. Oh, okay. No, I haven't seen that one yet. I'll look, though. What is the flight range of emerald ash borer uh, from dawn? The, uh, on their own, they move about approximately half a mile per year. Uh, they're not, they like to, to kind of hang around where everything's, where they've already established themselves. On their own, emerald ash borer simply does not move that quickly. So uh, they're pretty slow movers if left to their own devices. Unfortunately, uh, we don't leave them to their own devices. We're always moving them all over the place. Okay, hang on. I'm trying to, to uh, find out where I am on questions. Okay, hang on a second. There we go. Have a question. Isn't there a native wasp that feeds on the adult beetles? Uh, yes, there is a native wasp that does that. And once again, um, Cliff, if you don't mind responding to that about the native wasp, it's, they're, they're used for detection of the insect, which is fascinating. Let's see. Oh, the video for soil drenching. I can certainly uh, take you back to that without any problem. Let me get that up for you. Whoop, I went past it. There's the address. And once again, if, if you um, uh, wanted to visit the recording of this, you can look at it later as well. And it looks like Deb's been busy typing, typing. That's great. Okay, I live in Minnesota and know that some local cities have privately requested that citizens do not use soil drenches due to water contamination concerns. Is this a trend across infected uh, states and should we be concerned about citizens uh, using soil drenches? Well, once again, it certainly is possible with the soil drench to have runoff if it's used improperly. The good news about uh, soil drenches is most of the time you're not going to be pouring enough of it to be a big problem. Um, if you are around water, if you are near water, it, is, it says on the label not to use this stuff in that form. So if they're, if they're actually contaminating groundwater with it or, or ponds or lakes, they're not using it properly. The other thing to remember is that, that um, you're, the overall use of this is going to be very limited. There's not going to be uh, millions of trees being treated. So I have not heard of, of uh, communities asking people not to use it. I understand the concerns, but once again, if it's used properly, I don't think it poses a danger. And once again, uh, there is limits on how much you can use within an acre. So people do need to be aware of that and, and uh, use that. Okay, let me scan again. Well, hang on a second. Sorry. Oh, there we are. Okay. Is it possible to get biocontrols for release in Wisconsin? And if so, who do we contact? Um, <clears throat> the person I would suggest you contact would be Leah Bauer, uh, who is with the U.S. Forest Service, and she's housed um, at Michigan State. If Kurt, if you want to send me an email, I can give you her address. I don't know what the criteria is be, that is being used right now for those releases, but I'd be certainly happy to hook you up with Leah and you can talk to her about it. So just send me an um, email at ellisj at purdue.edu. Okay, thank you for your answers there. Do you have to be a licensed applicator to use the Safari Systemic Bark Spray? Cliff, I must defer to you. Okay, Cliff is uh, checking that out for us right now.
So hang on, we'll have that answer for you pretty soon. Thank you, Deb and Cliff, for those answers. I've heard new research suggests that there are also feeder roots near the trunk, not only in the drip line. I'm going to let that conversation continue with Deb because I, I, I don't know. Where do you say that we could learn about collecting ash tree seeds? Once again, you can go to emeraldashboard.info uh, and there is a, a section on that. Maybe Robin, you can type in that address if you don't mind. Um, that's a, a certainly a worthwhile project to contribute to the seed bank. They do have very strict criteria about what they want. So um, Robin, if you can respond to Pam, that would be great. Oh, she are, gosh, she's good. She already did it. Okay. And a question about Christmas trees. EAB hitchhiking on Christmas trees, extremely unlikely. Um, uh, they, would have, they would have no reason to be on or near a Christmas tree. They like ash and ash only. So I do not think that that's a, a possibility. Okay, thank you, Robin. Let's see. Whoops, this thing keeps jumping on me. All righty. That's good. Okay. Is anyone, Amy asks, is anyone working on developing EAB resistant ash tree varieties? And um, has that been addressed yet? The answer is, uh, there, yes, there is work being done on looking at the, the genes on those Asian trees that convey uh, resistance. It's a, a, it's, a, um, it's a very complicated system as I understand it. And it, it's not just one gene, it's, it's multiple genes and it's, they're certainly still working on it, but I, I don't think that we have anything that's viable quite yet on that. But yes, there is work being done on that. Hopefully in the next decade or so we'll see something like that. I hope so. It's a shame to lose ash trees because they're absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, any efforts to bring Asian ash trees to the USA? Um, I'll address that first. Um, you wouldn't want to do that because if you brought Asian ash trees over and put them out here in the USA, our native um, species that attack ash would have a heyday because the Asian trees would have no natural resistance. They wouldn't have any uh, complement of natural enemies. It'd just be the reverse of what happened with emerald ash borer. So you, you, you probably don't want to to just bring them over per se. Um, you asked too, if, uh, Linda, if um, is there an, uh, an effort to genetically introduce, or genetically introduce Asian ash tree genetic material? And I think I already addressed that part of it. Okay, great. I think I'm at the end of it. Sweet. And it is 12:01. So, I mean, I'm willing to sit here uh, for another couple minutes. If you have any more questions, please feel free to, uh, to ask them now. Or even if you have questions later that you think of, you're always welcome to contact Amy, Robin, or I at EAB uh, University. Yeah, also Cliff is pointing out if you have a question that you ask on this chat that we missed, please resend it and we'll, it's, the way this works is kind of hard to see, see all the questions because you only have a very small window. But uh, if we miss one, if you want to resend it now, we'll certainly take a stab at it. Well, thank you, John. That's very nice of you to say. Appreciate that. Thank you, Amy. You know, it's really fun to do these seminar things, too. It's great to, to hear from all the people all over the country. Thank you for, for, um, for your comments. I really appreciate that. Ah, here's a question from Randy to how do the costs vary on the pesticides? 
Ah, uh, boy, that's one that I'm, I'm not going to address, because <laughs> I don't know. Maybe Deb can comment on that. Yeah. Oh, thanks for the nice comments, everybody. That's really good. I appreciate it. See, when will this be archived on the website? I missed the first half. I, uh, I believe that by probably by this evening it'll be up. So uh, you will um, be able to get on there fairly quickly. Yeah, I will, by the way, I'll be following up the pretests with a little post-test in the next day or two. Um, I hope you all don't mind doing it. I try to keep it short, but it really does give us some good information on the direction that we need to be taking with this. So look for that, please. Thank you, Catherine. That's nice.